today as we come to the table. Listen, a true sign of maturity is when we don't care anymore what people think, we care what Jesus thinks. Then we, when we really begin to mature, it's going to be, I don't, it's not what my friends think or what they're going to think or what's going to happen. It's what does Jesus think? That's all that we need to be concerned about because he's the only one we're going to answer to. And I know that's easier said than done because we all have that same struggle and then we grow and we mature and we get to where we care less and less about what other people think. And I think sometimes it's just because we get older that we don't care and maybe it's not for the best reasons. Maybe we get grumpy even. I don't know. But we need to grow to the place where we say, I only care what Jesus thinks. He's the one. He says, I don't, I'm not worried about the honor of men. Do you care more about the opinions of others or the opinion of God? It's sometimes easier to focus on the here and now, especially when it comes to the viewpoint of friends and family. We're eager to impress those around us, aren't we? Well, thanks for taking the time to join us as we come to the table. The daily Bible study program of Mark Kirk, Senior Pastor, Calvary Knoxville. In today's message, Pastor Mark will remind you to prioritize God's view of you instead of others. In the end, He's still all that matters. Today, Pastor Mark will teach about four witnesses in our passage. Are you living out your faith so others can see how good you are? Or are you living out your faith for God's glory? A challenging question to consider as we join Pastor Mark in the book of John, chapter 5 as he continues his message entitled, The Four Witnesses of Jesus. And how is it you develop a relationship with someone? Spend time with them. That's what they needed to do. They weren't doing that. They weren't just loving God. They were just doing intellectual gymnastics and advancing about who knew the most and who could memorize the most and who had the most authority and who's this Jesus now who dares challenge our intellectual prowess as the most scholastic scholars, probably redundant there, in the world. You know, we're the ones, we're the professors, we're the ones that know what we're talking about. Who do you think you are? He says, you don't even know the God you're espousing. How sad is that? And so I warn us today, make sure that it's not just a religious intellectual exercise that you're calling a relationship. Make sure you really know the Lord. Now, I, I want to qualify that because every time I do this, I get people, it happened again last week, I, why do I challenge you on your faith in Christ? Why do I challenge you that you really know the Lord? Here's why. Because I grew up religious as a pastor's son going to church every Sunday, and it wasn't until I was 25 years old, I didn't go to church every Sunday by the time I got to college, but growing up to college, and until I was 25, I didn't know the Lord. I wasn't saved, but I would have told you that I was. I thought that I was. And so I thought that because of the religious things I had done, I knew God. Because I know that I didn't, I know there's more people out there like me. I know there are. There has to be. And so oftentimes I'll say, make sure you're in the faith. Make sure you know the Lord. And then I'll, we'll go and clean the sanctuary up and find fingernails all in the different rows. And you guys calling me on the phone and saying, I don't think I really know the Lord. I'm like, I had said one of those here just recently. I'm like, I want you to calm down. I'm not trying to scare the flock of God. That's not what I'm called to do. Mark, go scare the flock today. Get ready, you know. All of you are going to hell. You know, whatever. If you know the Lord, you're his children. You're his flock. No one can yank you out of his hand. You have your place in heaven. How do I know I'm his child? How do I know, Pastor Mark? Because you say I better make sure. Romans chapter 9 says, if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth, you will be saved. Do you believe in your heart? Have you confessed with your mouth? You're one of his kids. Relax. Now, if you hadn't believed in your heart and confessed with your mouth... Be afraid of judgment. That's a good thing, believe it or not. Because that drives you to become one of his children so you know you won't be judged. Because on judgment day, all the kids of God, we just get rewards. But all those who don't know God, they stand before him in judgment eternally. And so these guys, although they had all this knowledge and all these scriptures, at this point, 
and hopefully some of them were saved before they died. We know that some of the priests did get saved. These guys are unsaved. And nobody could argue the Bible with them. They knew the Bible technically better than anyone on the planet, but they didn't know the God of the Bible. And that was their problem. And so the Lord tells them what the problem is and why. He says, you don't, you don't have God's word living in you because you don't believe in me, the one whom God sent, which again would have been a slap to their pride. But the fact that they didn't believe in Jesus proved what he was saying. It was the very proof that showed they didn't know him because they didn't believe in him. And if you, know, if you believe Jesus, you'll believe his word and you'll, you'll know him. And so it is amazing to me that people can devote their entire lives to the Bible and study it like that and not know the Lord. But the Bible says that it can happen that way. You have to know him on a personal level, though, for it to make sense. And notice what he says to them now, knowing that they would memorize the Bible. And some of them, up to five books of the Bible that we know of, this next verse makes more sense. Look at verse 39. He said, you search the scriptures. You know, you're like the doctor looking at the MRI and the CAT scan, seeing all the outline of the brain and seeing every ligament in the body and every way the tissues connect. You see your patient that you think, so to speak, you're like a doctor would see every detail, but you don't know the patient. You don't know the one you're examining. He says, I'm the one you're examining. I am the Word. You search the Scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life. For these are they which testify of me. Wow, is it getting heated up or what? You guys think you're so bright, you're so smart, you're so intellectual. You've got all these things. You think that I'm some ignorant country boy from Galilee, and I'm here to tell you I am God in human form. You're studying me, and you don't even know who you're studying. You talk about pride kicking in. This is when the anger, now you know why they hated him so much. The pride, pride of man is a very strong and powerful thing. And that's why we have to humble ourselves before the Lord. Who do you think you are? You didn't even go to Bible college, Jesus. You don't have a seminary degree, Jesus. You didn't study with us. We know. And they had the only real Bible university in the world at that time. They're in Jerusalem. Jesus didn't go there. The disciples didn't go. Who do they think they are, right? So this was a huge insult to the intellectual mindset. By the way, I do find it interesting that God chose to not go to those guys and call them to be his disciples. You would think he would go to the guys who knew the Bible the best and say, now be my disciples. But he went to a bunch of guys who just, you know, just normal guys. He said, follow me. See, that's, that makes me happy because that means he's saying to you guys, you don't have to be something in the world's eyes as special. Follow Jesus. He'll use you to change the world. Is that exciting or what? That's who he calls. That's who he chooses. He says, but hey, these are the scriptures. They testify of me. And this is amazing to me because, again, testifying of the Lord, the Bible says that Jesus, so to speak, is the Lord. I mean, Jesus is the Bible. He is. Jesus said in John chapter 1, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God, rather that's what John said. And then over in verse 14 it says, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Jesus is saying, I am the Word. You're studying me on paper, and you don't even recognize who I am. You don't even see who I am. You don't even know who I am. And, and, and again, he says, because of this, you're being left out of the loop. Now, this is interesting to me, guys, in light of, of the Bible here, because the Lord is saying that he is the scriptures they're searching out, that that's where they will find him. But what were the scriptures they had at this day? Let me even rephrase that question. What were the only scriptures they had that day? The Old Testament. That's all they had. You ever heard somebody say, well, we don't really need the Old Testament today because now we have the New Testament. That's all they had. Jesus said, I am the Old Testament. When you're searching out the scriptures, you are searching me out. Even as I am the word of God, I literally am the Old Testament, even as I'm the New Testament. Jesus speaking, quoted this in Psalm 47, Jesus speaking prophetically through the psalmist and repeated by Paul in Hebrews 10 verses 5 through 7 said this, Therefore, when he came into the world, that is Jesus, here's what Jesus said, and I quote, Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, he's speaking to the Father in heaven, but a body you have prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, you had no pleasure. And then I said, Behold, I have come, and here it is, in the volume, note that word, in the volume of the book, it is written of me to do your will, O God. That word volume means literally the entirety Here's my point. Jesus says in the, Old Testament, in the Old Testament, in the entirety of my word, old and later to be revealed New Testament, it's all speaking about me, and it is me. You're studying me. And again, not getting some mystical weird thing that he's words on paper. We know that. 
But he's saying, I'm being revealed this way. Now this is, again, I, I bring that point back because we need to be students of the entire Bible. We need to know the Old Testament as well as we know the New. And if someone tells you that the Old Testament is not for today, ask them why. Well, we're no longer under the law. Well, first of all, did you know the law only comprises two and a half books of the Old Testament? That's it. Genesis is history. Half of Exodus is history. Half of Exodus is law. N numbers and, and Judges, not Numbers and Judges, I'm sorry, Leviticus. Those are the law books. Deuteronomy repeats the law. So if you want to talk about not being under the law, you've only got two and a half books in the entire Bible to leave out. But let me say this, the only reason we're not under the law is because Jesus fulfilled it. We can't get to heaven by the law, but all of God's Word is still good, and it is Jesus. The Old Testament is like the foundation on which we stand, and without understanding the Old Testament, we can't understand the New. Listen, a lot of the issues going on today politically, I see a lot of the church standing in the wrong place. And I'm not going to talk about them, I'm not going to, you know, the last thing I want to do is divide the body of Christ, but here's what grieves my heart. I see things that if you know the Bible in its entirety are very clear where the believer should stand. And I see a lot of believers standing in the wrong place. And I go, how could that be? It's because what the Lord said, my people perish what? Due to a lack of knowledge. Why? Because the Old Testament is no longer taught in many churches. And sadly, much of the New Testament is oftentimes not taught in many of the churches. If you're going to be a whole Christian, you need the whole Bible. And if you're going to understand all the political issues of the day and where we're to stand as believers, you've got to know everything from Genesis to Revelation. The New Testament is not enough. Yes, the New Testament is plastered with grace and mercy and forgiveness and all that, but the Old Testament lays the foundation about the fact that all of us will be held accountable to God and that God is a God of justice and one day judgment. And so you have to have the foundation of both to understand how do we deal with crime, how do we deal with issues, how do we deal with all these things, and still have grace and mercy and love. How do we do that? It reminds me of the man I read about this week who was digging, uh, digging out and destroying the foundation of his own home. And a friend warned him, he said, if you remove the foundation of your home, it'll collapse. Like, what are you doing? He said, that's no problem. I live upstairs. <laughs> a lot of us as believers live only upstairs. We move into the New Testament and we leave the foundation of the Old Testament destroyed. Forget it. It has no purpose. For it. No, the Old Testament is Jesus it's another part of Jesus. And the New Testament is Jesus. He revealed himself. By the way, think of the early church. Did you realize the early church did not have the New Testament? You ever think about that? All they had was the Old Testament. The New Testament was written throughout the first century. They had all of the New Testament starting into the next century. But they didn't even have the New Testament for the early church, the church that came right after Jesus. Can you imagine coming together? When they came together for Bible studies and when they came together as a church, what is the only thing they studied? The Old Testament. That's right. The grace-filled, not under law church, all they studied was the Old Testament. It's all they had. It's all God had given them at that time. That's, if you showed up and you said, well, you know what? Uh, we can't really look at the Old Testament because now Jesus has died on the cross. Thank you for all coming today. And we really have nothing to share at all. Um, it's currently being written. Our, the next generation, they're going to love it. The next generation, it's great. They'll have a whole thing they call the New Testament, and they'll be able to say, but for us, let's just sing a song, let's, and then y'all have a great week. We'll see you next week, and we'll come together and once again do nothing. <laughs> I make light of it and make a joke of it because I want to drive in your heart how important it is that you become a student of the Old Testament as well. You've got to know the Word of God, guys, every bit of it, or you're not going to understand what's going on in our nation today, and you're not going to know where you're supposed to stand. And I see Christians fighting for the wrong things. It breaks my heart because they don't know what they're doing. And if they only knew the Old Testament, they'd be fine. We need the full counsel of God's Word and not emotions and opinions and a few verses out of the New Testament that we can slap Jesus to it or put a, put a fish on, on Facebook and say, I'm backed up because this verse says that. You're wrong. And you need to know the whole Bible. And I'm glad I'm not on Facebook because I don't want to get pulled into all those arguments. And it's, it's a thing. I think that's why I encourage you. Don't get pulled into a bunch of arguments online. I've never seen that be profitable. If anybody says, you know what, I argued for days and days and somebody got saved, come tell me. I'd like to hear that story. <laughs> because then I can say, okay, it has worked. But as far as I know, it's never, ever worked. It's just arguments back and forth that divide the body of Christ and the world watches and goes, what are you doing? You know, anyway, I'm not saying there's not some benefit to making a stand. Sometimes you need to make a stand, but I would encourage you if you do that, make a stand, then get out. Here's what the word says, then get out. Because it'll go back and forth forever. But anyway, so... Here, 
He says, you know, you, you, they, they testify of me. He says, look at verse 40, but you are not willing to come to me that you may have life. It wasn't that they couldn't come to the Lord. They weren't willing to. They refused to repent. He says, but I, I do not receive honor from men. That is, I don't, I'm not trying to say all this so that I'll be lifted up and receive honor from men. And yet how many of us do that? We want to receive honor from men, don't we? We want to receive honor from men. We want to be important. Listen, a true sign of maturity is when we don't care anymore what people think. We care what Jesus thinks. Then we, when we really begin to mature, where it's going to be, I don't, it's not what my friends think or what they're going to think or what's going to happen. It's what does Jesus think? That's all that we need to be concerned about because he's the only one we're going to answer to. And I know that's easier said than done because we all have that same struggle and then we grow and we mature and we get to where we care less and less about what other people think. And I think sometimes it's just because we get older that we don't care and maybe it's not for the best reasons. Maybe we get grumpy even. I don't know. But we need to grow to the place where we say, I only care what Jesus thinks. He's the one. He says, I don't, I'm not worried about the honor of men. So I'm not giving you all these witnesses to validate myself and talk about how great I am. And you've been, He said, I'm, just, I'm doing this so that you might be saved. I want you to know the truth. He says, but I know that you do not have the love of God in you. And see, that was their missing thing. They had all the word of God in them, but they didn't have the relationship and the love of God in them. And what does the Bible say? Look, look if, you, if you give your body to be burned, you become a martyr. You go to the mission field and you die for your faith. If you don't have love, it profits you nothing. Think about that. The Lord said that. You can give your body to be burned even. You can sacrifice yourself. If you don't have love, it means nothing. Everything has the foundation and basis of love and that's from the relationship we have with the Lord. I have come in my Father's name, and you do not receive me. If another comes in his own name, him you will receive. He speaks prophetically now. He's talking about the Antichrist. Jesus said, I have come, and I'm revealing myself to you as the Messiah. There's going to come one in the last days. He's going to be a false prophet and a false leader and a false Messiah. You guys are going to follow him hook, line, and sinker. Why? Because he's going to come in as a smooth politician. He's going to come in as somebody with all the answers. He's going to bring peace to the Middle East. And you're going to think, our Messiah has arrived. I remember somebody recently sharing somewhere, and there was a Jewish person there. And they shared, we are excited now about the second coming of Christ. And he was going to speak there at that event. He said, well, I'm excited about the first coming. He said, you guys believe that he's coming back. I believe he hadn't come yet. And when you ask them, what do you think he's going to be like? Listen, the Bible says he's going to be a very smooth-talking world-loving politician that's going to just bring peace to the Middle East and just bring all the teams together. He's going to be amazingly anointed by the enemy, so to speak. Charismatic, bringing in peace and all this, all this stuff, whatever. And they're going to, they're going to follow him. When you ask him, who, how will you know your Messiah? He's going to be a, a, a wonderful politician that will come in and, and captivate the whole world and he'll lead us into peace in the Middle East. They just described the Antichrist. They are completely set up and blind and unaware of what's coming their way, I believe, very soon. And so the Lord says, He's coming, and when He does, you're going to believe in Him. He says, how can you believe? How can you believe, in other words, when you who receive honor from one another and you don't seek the honor that comes from the only God? If you're worried about what men think all the time, how can you believe in the true God? Because believing in Him means you're only concerned about what He thinks. So we have to lose the fear of man, get our eyes off what our friends think, forget about what other people say about us, and focus on what Jesus is saying about us and what we're saying about him. He says, you can't really walk with God and have a right relationship until that happens. He says, do not think that I shall accuse you to the Father. He says, I'll be your judge, but I won't be your accuser. Notice this, who will be the accuser? There is one who accuses you, Moses, in whom you trust. The very Bible that you think is backing your point is going to speak against you on that day and prove you wrong. Because you don't know the one who wrote it. Listen, if you don't know the one who wrote it, it makes no sense to you. You can't interpret it. I get, I get amazed at people that can read certain portions of Scripture. And the moment the Lord says it, I know what he meant. And you know what he meant. He says it. And you just know. You know what he meant because you know him. You have a relationship. You'll see people in the world read it. And they'll say the same thing. And they'll come up with some whole bizarre thing. Like, how did you get that? You obviously don't know the one that I know. Because if you knew him, you'd know it couldn't mean that. And that's what he's saying to them. The one that's going to accuse you is Moses, in whom you trust. You think you know Moses, but you don't know Moses. I mean, you know him. Maybe you know part of him, but he was speaking to me. Notice this. For if you believe Moses, you would believe me. For he wrote about me. That is, I'm in the volume of the book. All the Old Testament is me also, he's saying. And there are example after example. One would be, of course, Abraham and Isaac going to sacrifice his son on the Temple Mount. Again, that's that whole thing, that picture of the father, the son. He's all in there. He says, he wrote about me. It's me that he was talking about. And so uh, this just, this sums it up. He says, but if you do not believe his writings, how will you believe my words? 
So if you don't believe what Moses said, you say you do, but you don't because he's talking about me. Then how are you going to believe me? If you don't, here sums it up. If you don't believe the Bible, there's no hope. If you believe that man wrote the Bible, there's no hope. You have to know, not believe, you have to know that God wrote the Bible. And, and God simply used the men that he used to pen it as his pencils. That's all they were. And that's what the Bible tells us. They wrote down what God wanted written down. Well, Mark, how do you know that it's really God's word? How do we know this? There's a number of reasons that scholars know that. And they call them, you know, there's hermeneutical principles that we know the word of God. And there's tests they put them through. One is, is that it has to have no errors and be life-changing in power. That's why you don't see a lot of different books in the Bible. Why are certain books not in the Bible that you've heard about? Oh, did you hear about the book of Judas or the book of this or the book of Thomas or the book of that? Yeah, I've heard about all those false books. What about them? (laughs) Why aren't they in the Bible? Because they have errors. And they've been proven wrong. God is 100% accurate. He can have no errors. And for those who tell you, well, they found contradictions. There are no contradictions. They haven't found any. Don't believe them. Ask them to show you one. They won't be able to. And if someone claims to have a contradiction, it's because they don't know the full counsel of God's word. That's the bottom line. And so, guys, believe his word. Believe in the Lord. Trust in him. I guess the question for us as we finish today is, what is God going to judge us by on judgment day? When I stand before the Lord on judgment day, all I want to be judged by is Jesus on the cross and the fact that he rose from the dead and that I believe in him. If you have that judgment, that's all you're going to face is is basically you're going to just reward. You're going to get into heaven and you're going to get reward. But if you're facing God on just your own merit without Jesus, well, I read the New Testament and he seems to be a gracious God, so I'm sure I'll get in. Guess what you'll be judged by if you don't receive Jesus on judgment day? The Old Testament. The law. Mark, what do you mean? Jesus died for the law. Jesus died for the law for those who receive it. But if you don't receive Jesus, guess what you're still under? The law. And that means God will open the books. And from the law of Moses, even as he said here, I won't have to accuse you. Have you ever lied? You ever lusted? You ever done any kind of sin at all? The Bible covers it all. You're guilty before God. Depart from me, I never knew you. Wow. Sometimes I think we forget that the unbeliever is still under the Old Testament law. Jesus is the only release from that that mankind has. And so that will be the judgment that we all face on judgment day. Here's my heart. Don't worry about it. Receive Jesus now and just rejoice. I look forward to that day. You know, the worst thought I have is, Lord, I'm so sorry I didn't do better. I'm sorry that I didn't stand for you like I should. I'm sorry that I failed. I'm sorry that I maybe unintentionally said some things that weren't exactly 100% accurate to the Calvary Knoxville. I never would do that on purpose, but the Bible says that many, many pastors make errors. And so God knows that, and I'll trust in God's mercy. So I'm going to be before him going, oh, no, you know, I mean, not in the sense of, oh, no, that I'm going to be judged, but, Lord, I wish I had done better for you. That's going to be my only concern. And then I get to go into the kingdom and there's going to be reward. That's your concern too. That's your only thought is you're going to get reward and get in the kingdom. But if you're here today and you don't know him, you're going to have a much greater concern. And that is the judgment that's going to be passed on how you lived your life based on the Old Testament. How do I fix that, Mark? Very easy. Just ask God to forgive you. Confess your sin. You have to humble yourself and confess. You can't be like these religious leaders. and Well, I think this. Stop that stuff. He didn't care what you think. Lord, you're right. I'm wrong. You're right. Forgive me. I believe you died for me. I receive you as Lord. And the Bible says you will be saved into the kingdom of God. Thanks for spending the last half hour with us at the table of God's word. Pastor Mark will continue teaching through the book of John next time, but you don't have to wait for our next episode to keep digging into the Bible. You can access more messages right now at pastormarkkirk.com or subscribe to the daily podcast right from our website. And feel free to share these teachings with your friends or family members or someone who wants to know more about what the Bible has to say. The book of John is a great introduction to who Jesus is, and it might just be the conversation starter you've been looking for. That website again is pastormarkkirk.com. Hey, are you listening right now in the Knoxville area? If so, we want to meet you. 
Here's Pastor Mark with a personal invitation. Thanks, Greg. I want to let you know there's a seat waiting for you here at Calvary Knoxville. We've been here since 1997, and it's been an honor to see God do such incredible things in our fellowship and in this community. Come join us as we invest in God's Word and in each other. And yes, we're meeting in person. All our services and ministries are being held each week. But we're also streaming online for those who can't make it in person. You can find out everything by clicking on the Our Church section at PastorMarkKirk.com. I'm excited to see you this weekend, and I hope you'll join me again the next time we come to the table. to the table is a radio outreach ministry of Calvary Knoxville